Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Lori Wingard. In our show tonight, we'll visit the Nonprofit Association Conference at the Sheraton Waikiki and get some hints about philanthropy from one of Hawaii's biggest philanthropists, Pierre Omidyar. Pierre Omidyar, if you didn't know, is the founder of eBay and a multi-billionaire who lives in Hawaii and is very committed to Hawaii and does a lot for Hawaii's energy conservation, agriculture, and sustainability. Last week, we visited the two-day Conference of Nonprofit Communities of Hawaii at the Sheraton Waikiki Hotel. Every nonprofit you could think of was there. The conference was called Delivering Innovation. The future is not what it used to be. We like that. We attended the keynote luncheon featuring Pierre Omidyar and Kelvin Takeda, CEO of the Hawaii Community Foundation a local foundation that has received some $50 million from Pierre Omidyar. The title of the keynote was Igniting Change and Creating Impact, A Philanthropic Journey. We found we weren't alone at this lunch. Pierre Omidyar doesn't appear in public very often, and people are often very interested in hearing what he has to say. That day, there were more than 600 people there to hear what he had to say. Alan Tang, president of the Hawaii Community Foundation, opened the proceedings and introduced Governor Neil Abercrombie. Without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our Honorable Governor of Hawaii, Neil Abercrombie. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran minister in Nazi Germany. He was uh, imprisoned in early 1943 and was among the last people executed by the Nazi regime in 1945. He wrote a poem called Stations on the Road to Freedom. And in it, uh, one of them is the word action. A daring to do what is right, not what fancy may tell you. Valiantly grasping occasions, not cravenly doubting. Freedom comes only through deeds, not through thoughts taking wing. Faint not nor fear, but go out to the storm and the action. Trusting in God whose commandment you faithfully follow. Freedom, exultant, will welcome your spirit with joy. I thought of that last year as I contemplated the awesome responsibilities that each of you have, that each of the organizations you represent today have, the commitment that each of you has made, not to yourselves, but to the world in which we live. Bonhoeffer went on in other letters that he, uh, that he wrote and observations that he made that he had discovered in prison uh, that it was not a question of self-knowledge, that seeking self-knowledge was in fact a form of selfishness, that self-knowledge means something only in community. It means something only when we immerse ourselves in the lives of those around us. Only then can we find our true direction and find true meaning uh, in ourselves. I read that part on the stations on the road to freedom last year, and I do so again today because I was struck by the last line last year, and I'm struck by it today. I think every one of you here today deserves to be greeted in the spirit of joy. You are achieving true freedom by your commitment to each other here today, to all the organizations repre represented here today, and to the people and humanity you serve. After a bugle call, Kelvin Takeda and Pierre Omidyar sat down on big easy chairs on the stage. Kelvin led off by giving the audience some test questions about Pierre and Pierre's online newspaper, Civil Beat. We're gonna ask for audience participation 
around five questions about Pierre that we're going to ask, and we want to show of hands around each of the questions, and then we'll get Pierre to answer them and see whether you knew the right answer. So we'll start off with the first question. There we go. When was eBay created? It was uh, actually Labor Day, Labor Day weekend, Labor Day uh, uh, 1995. And you know, most people uh, here uh, would use Labor Day to probably go to the beach, you know, with the family, this kind of thing. But uh, what I realized is that you know you can't take your laptop to the beach, so uh, so we uh, uh, so we stayed home. And uh, since then, it's been a remarkable, uh, remarkable uh, ride. Um, we really, uh, uh, you know, created this business uh, 16 years ago now. Uh, now it's in nearly every country around the globe. And what I really learned from that was that when you give people the tools that they need uh, to pursue their own passions, uh, to build a business, then actually wonderful things happen. And so eBay was really one of the, one of the first uh, platforms uh, of, the, of the web era. And we saw that people came together around shared interest, uh, and um, they built relationships with one another, and they used the tools that we provided to build uh, wonderful businesses. And so it's, uh, it was a remarkable use of, of Labor Day weekend. Kelvin and Pierre then had an informal conversation about Pierre's experiences in founding eBay and his philanthropic activities in Hawaii. That issue about values is really interesting because I think um, when we were talking earlier, uh, I learned that last year eBay sold approximately, the value of goods sold on eBay was over $60 billion. That's right. So that's, that's right. a remarkable story. But let's shift gears uh, off of eBay and let's talk about your philanthropy work for the next half hour okay. or so. So this year was a big milestone for you and Pam. Uh, $1 billion that you've given away at this point to philanthropic causes. Uh, just last month, Pam and Pierre were honored with the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy in a, cer a ceremony in New York. So as you start to think about it, let's, let's walk through this journey. How did, how did you get started? I think uh, you know, it really all began uh, uh, back at eBay, and as uh, as the company in 1998 was preparing for its IPO, uh, you know the growth of the company at the time was was incredible. We were in the first two years of our operation, we were grow growing 20 to 50 percent per month, and actually sustained that for the first two years. And and um, you know we really felt a tremendous sense of gratitude and responsibility for the community that was driving this growth. Uh, from the beginning, as I mentioned, values were really the core of, of, uh, of, of you know, my approach to running, running the business. And so as we were preparing for the IPO, um, we said, you know, we have to find a way to involve the community in, in the financial success that will, uh, that will eventually, hopefully, come from uh, being a public company and continuing to grow dramatically. And so what we did was, uh, we later found out was, um, uh, something that had never been done before. We created the eBay Foundation uh, with a grant of pre-IPO stock. Uh, and this was uh, really driven by my uh, partner, Jeff Skoll, uh, at the company. And we really we felt that this, was, this would be a great way to, to help the community uh, share in the financial rewards. And in fact, what we did is we granted $1 million worth of pre-IPO stock to, you know, to the eBay Foundation. Shortly after the IPO, that was worth $40 million. And so since then, many other private companies have followed in this model, and we think it's a really good model. So um, also, you and Pam went out and talked to a bunch of people, and, and right. one, of, one of which was Bill Drayton. Right, right? that's right. Yeah, so, so then, of course, the IPO happened, uh, and it was far more successful than, than uh, anyone had really uh, planned for. And all of a sudden, you know, we felt, uh, and we, we, we sort of felt the, the, the burden and responsibility to make sure that this wealth was put to good use. Um, you know, Pam and I talked about it and immediately re recognized that this was far more money than I could ever use, than, than she could ever use, than our family could ever use, than our future children could ever use, and their children and so forth. And so we really felt like we had to put it to good use. So we started having conversations with different people to get some advice, one of whom was this wonderful gentleman, Bill Drayton, who created uh, Ashoka, uh, really the pioneers in social entrepreneurship. 
And uh, he had a very important piece of advice. I met him in uh, Davos in 1999, uh, shortly after the IPO. And he said, you know, whatever you do, don't create a foundation. <laughs> and so, of course, that's what exactly what we did. That's exactly <laughs> what we did, is we created a, a foundation. And that was really the first, that's marked the first phase of our, uh, our philanthropic efforts. So what did you learn from that? I know that that was the first phase, but yeah. obviously you started to quickly shift and migrate from there. Yeah. You know, I really, uh, with a, with, after a few years of, of uh, trying to go the traditional route, um, I really started feeling uh, a little bit constrained. You know, during that time, so this was between 1999 and 2003 or so, eBay was continuing to grow and uh, grow dramatically. And in fact, I was talking about eBay and, and really investigating the social impact that eBay was having, as we talked about this idea that actually hundreds of millions of people had learned that they could trust a complete stranger over the internet. Now we kind of take that for granted. Uh, but you know, back then it was all new. And this was true social impact, because if you can increase the level of trust in a society, then actually wonderful things happen. At the end, Pierre took questions from the floor. There were some good ones, and he gave some good answers too. What advice can you give to the risk adverse? As a technology entrepreneur, uh, I understand that uh, risk is a part of, of creating something new. And that if you, uh, if you want to create something new, you have to take risk. Uh, if you don't want to create something new and you want to keep doing things the way they've been done you know, forever, then, then you don't have to take any risk. I think, I think one thing that people have a, a hard time with sometimes is accepting the possibility that they may try something and then fail, right? So it's easy to sort of look at me and say, oh, look, you know, it's easy for this guy to say, hey, go take a risk, because, I mean, he tried this one thing and it was successful. Um, but actually, in fact, um, eBay was my second startup, uh, not, not, uh, not my first. The first one did not fail. They had moderate, moderate success. Um, but, uh, but it is difficult for people to envision what might happen if I fail. What will people think about me? Will they ever want to work with me again? You know, this kind of thing. And, you know, and in, in Silicon Valley, we have a completely different approach. We say, if you haven't tried something and failed, and then actually learned from that failure, then why would I want to work with you, right? Because you, you haven't actually tried anything enough to learn from it. You know, you, you, of course we can learn in school, we can, you know, and so forth. But actually going out there, getting your hands dirty, investing yourself in something, trying, and then failing, and then learning, that's the best way to progress. Now, if you don't do the learning step after the failure, that's a whole different story. You've got to learn from the failures. But I would, I, I would say sort of the risk aversion. And, the, and then the other thing, I'm not sure what the context of the question was. Uh, the other thing is I think that the philanthropic sector uh, and the role of risk in the philanthropic sector, I'll just touch on that a little bit. You know, the, if you think about it, um, traditional philanthropy, traditional foundations, um, the, the, the grant officers, program officers, and so forth, they're really kind of measured on, um, uh, you know, are you, are you giving grants to good organizations that are doing, doing good work? And they don't really like to go to their board of trustees and say, by the way, we gave a grant to this organization and they, they were terrible. Like, that was awful, you know? Uh, and so, in fact, the, the, the standard of success for a funder is that you've really, 100% of the funds that you've given, put to use, have to be successful. After it was over, we caught up with some of the people who were there and asked them how they felt about the luncheon. I think it's interesting to hear a person talk about their dilemma of having so much money that they have to sit down and, and process through what are we going to do with all of this money. We have more than we could ever use ourselves, um, more than our children could use or our children's children could use. Therefore, big challenge to figure out how to use it purposefully and I believe he did a good job of I talking so, from too. his heart about how to share the wealth and, and do well for the community that he's chosen to be his home for him. I thought that the uh, format for the luncheon was fantastic, as for, particularly for the interplay between Pierre and uh, Kelvin. I thought they did a great job and I was just um, really impressed by 
Pierre's approach and, you know, using his values as the base and um, the whole idea of connectedness is fantastic and just how you can take that further. Oh, I thought it was excellent. Um, we've just had an overwhelming diversity in our offerings from uh, Sarah Reinerson, Reinerson in the morning. Um, you know, then a one brief session, workshop session with all kinds of diverse offerings. And then, of course, you know, the punch, the uh, Omidyar keynote luncheon, which was more than we expected. Um, he, he's such a humble, practical um, visionary, and he's inspiring for our community. Yes, I am. I'm a nonprofit person. And I love the focus on innovation because that's exactly what we need to allow change in the future. And uh, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that Piero Omidyar was talking about getting us to be more sustainable. 15% of all kinds of things, solar power, all kinds of things, food. And that relates to the sessions I went to with, with you recently, and I thought, these guys have got to get moving on that. So I, I love the focus on innovation and um, the need to mix different disciplines so that you can become more innovative. My favorite post-luncheon interview was the talk we had with Kelvin Takeda himself. The most important thing was to expose people to Pierre's thinking. You know, here's a guy who's internationally recognized as being one of the great philanthropic strategists of our generation. And for us to have a person like that living in Hawaii, uh, it's a great opportunity to share his wisdom with, with all of us. So how are nonprofits doing? Do you have a sense of it from this conference? Uh, you know, I think it's been a challenging time, Jay, right? I mean, demands are going up for services from virtually every nonprofit in every sector, and the resources are going down. But the fascinating thing about this conference is I just have this sense of energy and excitement, and I think the sector's up for the challenge. You know, uh, I think that um, uh, what in our experience, we've been blessed to be able to work with the Aminyars now for five years. and. Our experience in working with them has been a remarkable journey of a very thoughtful and deliberate approach to strategy. And it has helped us. I think it's been yeah. mutual. We've both shared with each other. So even this work around the state business transformation uh, in terms of the state government has been a real deliberate uh, approach on our part about what we were doing and what we expected to achieve. We're in a new time, aren't we? We're in a new time. I mean, I think that um, you know, uh, it used to be that I think the sectors saw themselves separately. So the private sector, the public sector, the nonprofit sector saw themselves separate. And I think over the last 10 years, we've seen a blending of some of those. But now I think it's absolutely impossible for us to get our work done without a level of collaboration and transparency that's going to drive this, right? You think about the work that we're trying to do in helping people who are on the brink of homelessness. Well, without the state having a system, a technological platform that allows people to access that from rural communities, they can't access services that are being provided by the state or federal government. Well, those things all go hand in hand, and it's impossible to think about us operating in our own domain without some level of cooperation. This was one impressive conference in the number and quality of attendees and in the speakers like Kelvin and Pierre. It was also an important conference. After all, nonprofits are really important in Hawaii. And what we found is that the nonprofit industry is alive and well, despite the recession. All we can say to them, all of them, is keep up the good work. We're depending on you to help our community in good times and sometimes bad.
Now for our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech's 4 to 5 p.m. weekday drive time radio series on KGU 760 AM continues this week covering business, Asia, tech, energy, the arts, and government. Tune in to 760 AM every weekday at 4 p.m. and raise your awareness on ThinkTech Radio. On January 26, 2012, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech will present the annual Deal of the Year Awards, celebrating the best deals of the year for entrepreneurs in Hawaii. Sign up for these programs on hvca.org. And now, here's Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, with this week's Spensation. We, uh, we got some footage this week of uh, the governor announcing uh, some developments in state bonds. What happened? To me, this is probably the highlight of the governor's first year in office. It shows that he's gotten control of the state's financial situation by essentially selling into the market about $1.3 billion in general obligation bonds. Uh, the good news is that the, the market took them up on. The credit rating is sound. The plan to use the money from the proceeds has bearing on the credit rating and on the ability to sell the bonds. And what has been demonstrated by his team is a real understanding of how to get the state's finances in order. He's going to be paying off uh, some things that have been, you know, repeatedly robbed like the hurricane fund and the rainy day fund to balance the budget. He's not kicking any debt down the road. The, uh, these bonds were sold at a great interest rate, 3.6 percent, and their payoff is rapid, 15 years. The resources to do that payoff are identifiable. So a lot of clouds have, have separated on our budget, and because he really inherited a mess. And of course, he, he didn't control the budget going into last year's legislature. It was pretty much fixed by the time he took office on the first part of December. I think we should all be really proud of the governor and his team for being able to pull this off. I mean, I know he is so excited at our Entrepreneur of the Year uh, awards luncheon where he gave our keynote. Uh, he sort of hinted it. He could barely, barely contain himself. He was so excited about it. I think um, a real feather in his cap, great time to celebrate his uh, leadership. Sort of proven out what I've been saying all along, which is, you know, give the guy a chance to, to make things happen. Uh, this, this, will, this will, should improve his ratings, I tell you that. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. And I, I also think it shows that there are still things that the executive can do uh, unilaterally that are beneficial. Imagine if this thing had to be wrangled out in a, a legislative session. And here's our co-working entrepreneurs, Richung Fujihira and Tony Stanford, to keep us current on their latest adventures at the Box Jelly. Hi, I've been sick for the past two weeks. This is orange juice. <laughs> One of the things that, as an entrepreneur, you don't really think about is, you know, you're throwing everything in there, including like the opportunity to get insurance or whatever. And then when you get really sick, you're like, oh, wow, didn't think about this one. So mm, we're going to have to think about something as far as health insurance goes, and we're going to think about that soon. Absolutely. But, you know, Ray Chung was able to build a strong enough team that would be able to work while, you know, be able to keep us going in the right direction, even from, from home, sick in bed, had a 104, was it? 104 for days. So we've, we've been able to use uh, good systems of everything from base camp to nimble, to just plain old email. So we're, we're look, the next stages of moving forward is we're looking at for a new location to grow into, and we're going to be using um, the meeting that's coming up next week to tap into a little bit to get some insight about uh, what's out there. One of the kind of good things that happened from being sick was I had to stop and not move and lay down and just think about you know a lot of things, and I think um, we're definitely going to be one, we got to find a new space, you know, very soon. And the other thing is, uh, we might be drastically changing uh, our business model as well. So, you know, when you reanalyze things, you could be able to move forward and and see the things that you don't get uh, when you're caught up in every day to day things. When you can step back and look at it as a whole, sometimes it, you know that's a true blessing. There's so many like emails and stuff. People are like, oh. Where are you? Oh <laughs> yeah. 
Your response time is not in five minutes. Why? I know, right? It's crazy. <laughs> so, so, yeah, should be good, but I don't know. Yeah, we probably will be changing our a lot of things. Like, it's tough for us because right now, it's like we're in a space and we don't quite break even yet. We're pretty close. We don't quite break even, but people need things that we don't have and we can't do in that small space. So it's like to go to the next phase, you know, is it worth, is it worth it? You know, like do we take that risk to go to the next phase and build bigger when we can't sustain the smaller one yet? But that's what our customers are asking for, you know? So it's like this kind of weird. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to the Scheidler Family Foundation which supports a number of educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including ThinkTech. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is the senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company, and CEO of CBI Polymers, a tech company in Hawaii, the manufacturer of Decon Gel, Decon Gel is the subject of an article this month in National Geographic. Oceanit, another local tech company, is one of Hawaii's largest and most diversified science and engineering companies. The big news is that two new volunteers have joined ThinkTech. They're Roger Ovaling, who will help us in an executive and administrative capacity, and Malcolm Makaru, who will help us on videography and editing. We are pleased and proud to have them on board. If you would like to be a volunteer for ThinkTech, please let us know. We'd like to have you on the team, too. You can volunteer by contacting us through thinktechhawaii.com. OK, Lori, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Lori does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. You bet, Jay. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a sponsor. Help us reach Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. Thanks for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Lori Wingard. Aloha, everyone. Thank you.